Tommy and Poor Loopy, and welcome back to the Northland Workshop. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, the rail arm saw has to be the most versatile tool available to a woodworker. In this case, today, we're going to be doing some wood turning with the rail arm saw. We're going to make these two little door stops right here that have little turn knobs on the end. And it's really not so much about the project, it's to demonstrate the ability of this DeWalt lathe attachment for the rail arm saw. Now this lathe attachment comes from the 1950s when the DeWalt rail arm saws were sold as a one tool workshop. And part of that was this lathe attachment. This lathe attachment at first glance seems a little silly. Why would you want to have to convert your rail arm saw into something that can power a lathe? Well, when you stop and think about it, it starts to make a little more sense because most people who do woodworking do very little wood turning. You might turn a couple chair legs at some point or some little knobs for drawer pulls, stuff like that, but predominantly you're making furniture, not turning bowls and vases and stuff like that. So to dedicate shop space to a lathe for a lot of people, it's just not something they can justify. The lathe attachment, however, has the ability to clamp to the rail arm saw table. It gets its power from the rail arm saw motor. And then the rest of the time, this thing, and it only weighs about 25 pounds, is free to be hung on the wall, in a corner. If you have a saw with an open base such as this, you could actually store this lathe under the rail arm saw when it's not in use so you really don't eat up any more floor space and you don't have to buy another motor for it. If you have the luxury of space and you think you're going to be using it more than you did originally, well, you can go ahead and bolt this thing to a dedicated stand, give it its own motor, and you have a dedicated lathe just like that. So you can start out with this temporary setup and then if you realize you use it way more than you thought you would, go ahead and bolt it to a stand. Now these things are fairly hard to find because they didn't sell real well, but I was lucky enough to have somebody give me this thing. And I really want to say thank you to everybody who's given me accessories for the rail arm saw and sold me rail arm saws at really good prices because that allows me to make these videos. All the accessories that I've used in these videos so far, the jigsaw attachment, the planer, the joiner attachment, those were all given to me by random people who like to see me do videos on them. So thank you very much for the rail arm saw accessories and the rail arm saws themselves. It really helps out. Without further ado, let's go ahead and start taking a look at how to use the lathe attachment. First, how do you install it on the rail arm saw? And then, how do we actually turn with the rail arm saw? Before we turn this rail arm saw into a lathe, I need to use it as a rail arm saw one last time to square up the ends on this piece of wood, which we're going to use for a project today. I figure we can make a couple turned door stops with this thing because it's a small project and it'll demonstrate the functionality of the lathe and I happen to have a scrap piece of wood which was the perfect size for that. Believe it or not, the thing I found most inconvenient about putting the lathe attachment on is having to unbolt this dust collection box from the back. You can't swing the motor over far enough with that thing on, but other than that, it really is a straightforward process. First thing I need to do is to remove the blade guard, and then I can remove the blade. I want to keep the arbor nut, but the blade washers and the blade need to come off. We need to talk about the pulley that goes on the arbor shaft briefly. This is the same size as the original one. Now I say it's the same as the original one because I don't have the original one and most likely if you get one of these lathe attachments you're not going to have the original pulley either because this is a small part, it's easy for it to get lost over time, so it's not surprising 
that most of them have disappeared. The good news is you can replace it with just a standard pulley because that's all it was originally. It needs to have a 5 8 hole in it because it's a 5 8 arbor. It needs to have flat edges on both sides. So I recommend a machine pulley, not a die cast pulley because a lot of die cast pulleys do not have flat sides to them. The reason you need flat sides on this is we're not using a set screw with it. In fact, I took the set screw right out of it so I could use the set screw for other things. But you don't want to use a set screw because that's going to drive itself into the threads and you're going to wreck the threads on your arbor. You don't want that. So instead of using a set screw, we're going to put that on and we're going to tighten it down with the arbor nut. And that's why you need the flat sides because the arbor nut is going to squeeze this thing together as if it was a saw blade. You can't grab this thing and hold it tight enough to really tighten this thing down with the wrench, especially if you have an electric brake on the saw. It'll take itself off the first time you shut it off. What I found is the easiest way to do it if you don't have an Allen wrench to put in the end of the arbor. If you have the Allen wrench, then by all means use that. If you don't, just take a spare V-belt that fits the pulley and use it as a strap wrench to hold it in place. And if you put some pressure on it, it'll hold right in place and you can tighten down the nut and it's good to go. The problem right now is that the pulley's right here and the headstock of the lathe is going to be out here. The belt can't make an angle like that. So to get around that, I'm going to unlock the carriage and spin it to the outrip position and lock it back in place. Now I'm going to take and unlock the miter clamp on the arm and I'm going to swing the arm to 90 degrees that way. And now go ahead and lock it back in place. Now I'm free to slide the motor side to side and use the rip lock to hold it in place to line it up with the pulley on the lathe. I'm ready to clamp the lathe to the table and I'm going to use these clamps that I made. They're just three pieces of three quarter inch thick wood that when I tighten down this bolt it clamps on the bottom of the table. These mimic the metal pieces that originally were here that just like the drive pulley they tend to get lost over time so if yours doesn't have those clamp pieces, you can make these wooden ones just like this. It's not very difficult and it doesn't take very long to make them. The other thing is, I think these hold a bit better. There's a wider bearing surface to grip the bottom of the table and I've heard that the metal clamps tended to slip. I haven't had any slipping issues with these wooden ones. So, what I do is I take the lathe and I get it right up on the edge, like so, and then I can slide it along. Once it's slid in place, roughly where I think it needs to go, I can go ahead and take the belt and put it on the pulley I want it to be on. Speaking of pulleys, let's take a quick look at what's under this cover. Just so you're familiar with what's going on under here. Here we have a standard step pulley. It's got four different steps so that way you have four different speeds to the lathe. And in the manual there's the chart for the different speeds. They're all fairly fast because that's a very fast motor but for spindle turning it's actually not that bad. I don't think I'd ever use it at its maximum speed but I have tried it at its second to fastest speed and it's actually not that bad for small spindle work. But that's what's under the cover. You don't need to remove the cover each time you change pulleys. There's enough space under there that you can get the belt to go from one to the next without taking this cover off. 
with the belt on the step that you want it to be on, we can go ahead and see if the motor lines up and it doesn't. Also, the belt doesn't reach. So we need to push this lathe back until we can hook the belt on. If there's a downside to this lathe, it's the fact that it has a step pulley in the headstock and just a single size pulley on the motor. What that means is as I go from the biggest pulley down to a smaller pulleys, I actually have to move this lathe away from the motor to take up the slack so this thing slides back and forth. Normally if you have two step pulleys and they're sized correctly, you don't have to go through that. But it's not that big a deal to unclamp the lathe and slide it back and forth. I'm going to snug up the clamp just a little bit and snug up the other one. Now what I'm going to do is just pull on it a little bit to take up the rest of the slack and tighten it down. Just tightening it down by hand is enough to keep the thing from moving. And then it only takes about half a turn with the wrench to tighten it up the rest of the way. What I did is I took the V-block that I made for my bandsaw and cut two lines on each end that intersect in the center of the workpiece. I then drilled a hole in each end so that way the points for the drive center and the cup center will be able to find their way in. Plus, this lathe has a very shallow angled drive center, so it's a very blunt point to it. And I'm afraid if I don't pre-drill it, it could possibly split. So I tighten up the tailstock, and I can go ahead and turn it until the cup engages and the spurs go into the saw curves on this side. At this point I want to tighten it up just a little bit more so I really have a hard time spinning it. Then I back off the pressure just a little bit until it gets easier to turn without much drag. At that point I can go ahead and lock the quill in place. Before we start turning, I want to put just a couple drops of oil on the end here because being a dead center, if I don't oil it, there's a good chance it's going to burn. With the tailstock set, headstock set, the thing's clamped to the table, the belt's all set, the last thing we have to worry about is the tool rest. Now this is one downside to this lathe and that is the tool rust. There are a couple issues I see with it. None of them are deal breakers, but it's something to be aware of if you're choosing this versus another lathe. Issue number one, it's aluminum. That is a bad choice for a tool rust because it's very easy to nick this and you don't want nicks in this thing because if there are nicks in the top of the tool rust, you're not going to be able to slide the chisels side to side smoothly and every time it hangs up it's going to telegraph to the workpiece as a little bump so you're going to see all the nicks in the tool rest forever in your workpiece and it's just more sanding you have to do. What I did is I took a file and I filed down the nicks I could find and so it's fairly smooth. I then went and rubbed a candle on it so it's waxed so that way it'll help it slide but aluminum really isn't a durable enough material to be a tool rest for a lathe. The other issue with this is this is bottomed out right here. And when it's bottomed out, this tool rest is centered with the axis of rotation. That's okay because with conventional turning tools, most of the time you want it at the center. But sometimes you want it below center especially if you're going to use carbide insert turning tools. 
Here's a conventional high speed steel skew chisel. Conventional turning tool, you want this tool rest to be at the center of the axis of rotation for most things. Sometimes you want it up a little bit more, sometimes you want it down a little bit more, but you can do everything you need to do with it centered. This on the other hand is a carbide insert turning tool. This carbide insert, when the tool is held parallel to the floor, the top of that carbide needs to be centered on the axis of rotation. It can't be above it, it can't be below it, otherwise you'll get a catch and it'll try to kick this thing. The only way to get this thing to be the center of rotation is to drop this tool rest roughly half an inch below the center so that way the top ends up being centered. I can't do that with this thing because it's bottomed out right here. Therefore, I can't use carbide cutting tools with this lathe. Back in the day, that wasn't an issue because back in the 50s when the lathe was made, these things hadn't been invented yet. So I can't really blame them for not seeing that, but it's something to be aware of if you want to use carbide tools, this is not the lathe for you. So, we have decided that we're going to use the high-speed steel tools for this, and it'll work just fine. But if you have your heart set on carbide, it's just something to consider. And with that, we are ready to do some wood turning. So what I want to do is make some sort of turn design really in like the last two inches of this thing on each side. Then we're going to cut it at a diagonal and we will get two turned door stops, essentially. Again, really this is to show the working of the lathe. So at this point, I've got the pommel cut made, which is the transition from square to round, and I've got the round part roughed out. Now what I want to do is make a little shoulder right here, because you can see where there's a little lip right there. I'm going to smooth this out, and I think I'm going to make a little cove here and a bead at the end, and I want to stay about three-eighths of an inch away from the end, so that way when I trim it off, I get rid of those cuts from the bandsaw. So I'm happy with how this turned out. I've removed the tool rest so that way I can sand this thing. What I don't want to do is I don't want to sand this pommel cut right here because that has the ability to just round over these nice edges on it and that gives it kind of a machine cut look when those edges are gone. on a diagonal line and I'm going to cut them apart right here on the bandsaw. <laughs> 
bandsaw did a pretty good job cutting the door stops apart, but it still has a rough surface. Plus, I still have this little end that I need to sand down. And to do that, I'm going to use the disc sander attachment on the rail arm saw. There. Now with a little final hand sanding, I can go ahead and put a couple coats of white bomb polyurethane on this. And then, what I think I'm going to do, because these are going to be used on wood floors and linoleum floors, I'm going to glue a piece of rubber on the bottom to give it a little bit of traction. If it was going to be used on carpet, probably wouldn't hurt to have a piece of rubber on the bottom anyways, but I don't think it's critical. And that is how we use the lathe attachment on the rail arm saw and, as a bonus, the disc sander on the rail arm saw.